Good afternoon and welcome to the latest webinar in the BioXL webinar series. My name is Adam Carter and uh, I'm the host for today and uh, the presenter for today uh, who will be telling us about all the new features in Gromax 2019 is Mark Abraham from KTH um, Royal Institute of Technology and also from the BioXL project. So um, uh, just to let you know before we go any further that this webinar is being recorded uh, and it will be made available later through the BioXL website. So if you need to point somebody else at it or to, to, re, to recap parts of it later on, you'll be able to find it there at, at bioxcel.eu. So before we make a start, before I hand over to Mark, I'm going to give a very quick uh, overview to remind people what we're doing here in BioXL. Uh, this is, uh, we've now been running for, for over three years. We're a center of excellence for computational biomolecular research. And we're trying to promote excellence in three particular areas. So the first of all, first one is in software itself. So as a project, we are specifically supporting Gromax, Haddock, uh, some aspects of CP2K, in particular uh, the, the QMMM interface for CP2K. And we're also working with other, uh, well, so, so they're, they're the key co codes that we are we're working on in the project. And one of our aims is to improve the performance, efficiency, and scalability of these key codes. Secondly, um, an important aspect of the project is usability. So as well as having fast and scalable codes, we want them to be easy to use, easy to integrate into workflow environments, for example. Um, and to that end, we are working with uh, software such as the uh, Comp SS and uh, the Common Workflow language as well to, to promote these things and to support usability in biomolecular workflows. And last but not least, we are also promoting consultancy and training uh, in the areas uh, of, of biomolecular research that we are working in uh, with an aim to promote the best practices and to train end users so that they can make better use of the resources, uh, the, the largest resources um, that they have available to them. So as we go through um, uh, the talk today, I think it's going to be easiest probably uh, to save up any questions that you have until the end. So there will be time to ask questions at the end. Um, and we're going to use the, the question feature in GoToWebinar to, to ask the questions. So if you do have a question, you can type it in um, at any time uh, into the question area, but we'll, we'll start addressing these at the end of the webinar. So um, at that point, uh, either if you have a microphone um, and uh, you're able to speak, I'll invite you to, to open your microphone and ask your question directly to the speaker. Otherwise, you can, uh, I can pass your question on to, on to Mark. So then today's presenter, Mark Abraham, is from KTH, Royal Institute of Technology, and he is the development manager of Gromax, which, as I'm sure that you are aware, is one of the world's most widely used HPC applications. He has uh, an ongoing role as a core developer in the team. And within the team, he focuses on modernizing the code base to be a sound platform for fast, flexible, and free molecular simulations. So he's taking responsibility for the strategic plan, the release management, and, coordinate, and he coordinates the global team from his base at uh, KTH in Stockholm. So uh, you're, you're hearing today from, uh, from the, the person who does have the responsibility for the, the plans and the, the, the future of the Gromax code. So it's your opportunity to ask questions at the end if there's anything specifically that you would, would like to ask. Okay, so uh, Mark then, I'm now going to, to hand over to you. So uh, if you would like to uh, start sharing your slides, then uh, we will be able to um, start the main part of today's webinar. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, uh, Adam. Uh, it's uh, wonderful to be with you all here today, and um, hopefully I can uh, communicate with you some of the uh, things that are going on in the, the Gromax code base that's such that we've been able to deliver uh, in Gromax 2019. Uh, and I hope that uh, you'll find that uh, an exciting um, new tool in your arsenal for, for doing biomolecular simulations. As many of you know, uh, Gromax's strength is in being able to simulate the kinds of biological macromolecules uh, that are of great interest in many areas of both uh, industrial and uh, academic research. 
Um, so we can see here on the screen a, a snapshot of one of the uh, configurations being explored by a small startup here in Stockholm uh, that are looking at how to how the, the process of skin drying out as it goes from the lower living layers to the outer dead layers takes place because they really like to be able to use molecular simulations to understand how to make these skin layers more permeable. Uh, that's quite difficult to do both in the, uh, in the laboratory uh, and in the computer simulation. So they've been using Gromax uh, to understand how best they might uh, uh, suggest pharmaceutical companies maybe apply a, a cream to the skin to make it more permeable so that certain classes of drugs can be delivered that way and don't have to be made into uh, an oral or an injective preparation. So that's just the very tiniest scratch on the surface of the kinds of things one can do uh, with the sorts of biomolecular simulations that uh, are possible in Gromax that we are continuing to make better uh, all the time uh, as we develop on the code. So a little bit of housekeeping to start with. Um, please do remember that all of our documentation is fully and freely available on the web. Uh, we're big believers in, in open documentation, uh, so all of that is available uh, immediately. If you would like to get a, a self-contained PDF, uh, this is something that we've been, we've been working on over the last year or two uh, as part of the BioXL project. Uh, so now all of our uh, documentation, uh, including the um, all of the maths and the physics uh, documented in the, the former reference manual, is now all available in the same place. Uh, you can download a large PDF, uh, but it's quite a few hundred pages, so please don't print it out. Uh, maybe print the, ch the chunk that you want and, and try to save a couple of trees. As a key part of that, uh, we have the, the release notes. Uh, so as we change the code uh, over the, um, the development cycle, uh, we keep track of those as we do. Uh, and so those are, are made available to you so that uh, as you're thinking about whether you want to adopt the newer versions of Gromax for your, your new scientific work, you can see what has changed and what you'll be able to take advantage of uh, in the, the, the new features. We did do a webinar uh, about a year ago on the new capabilities in Gromax 2018. Uh, and I would certainly encourage you to, to check those out uh, as well, uh, particularly if you're still using uh, Gromax versions that are even older still. Uh, you might prefer to uh, learn about all the things that happened then uh, that I won't have time to uh, talk over in any more detail now. We do have an annual release cycle associated with Gromax. Uh, so we got uh, Gromax 2019 out actually on New Year's Eve uh, of 2018. Uh, so it's been out for a couple of months now this year. Uh, and we've had time so far to make two patch releases. So we started with 2019 and we've now made the 2019.1 and 0.2 patch releases. We're planning to, as people give us feedback and we find little issues associated with the code, we'll release a patch version about every two months uh, for the, the remainder of this year. So we say that Gromax 2019 is in, is in active maintenance for this year and uh, we still have also in active maintenance last year's release. So if we find some some problem that would make it easy for someone to do science that they would prefer not to publish, that might be wrong in some way, uh, we would uh, make a, a critical fix to, to 2018. But we expect that uh, these will be few and far between uh, because that code base has been pretty stable. We still expect a few little rough edges around 2019 because we don't have 100% test coverage on everything, um, but 2018 has been out for a good while now, so we think we've found pretty much all the issues in it. All the Gromax releases, such as 2016, or the 5.1, or 5.0, or even 4 families, uh, are all now out of support. Uh, it's, uh, they've been good software in their day, uh, and they will still work, you will find, on pretty much all of the computers you can, you can have today. Um, but we can no longer uh, afford to spend the time to continue maintaining those with bug fixes and so forth. So we strongly encourage anybody starting a, a new scientific investigation to start with the 2019 version, uh, because that's the one that's currently under support. Uh, and if you're the one person who discovers an issue, then we'll be able to fix it there. If unfortunately someone finds an issue in an older version, if we can't replicate it in a newer version, we won't be able to spend the time doing any fixes on that. Um, so we do encourage you all to, to get in touch with the, the latest version, uh, and please give us any feedback about how you find they work. About September this year, we will uh, kick off the process of making our 2020 release. So you will see on the Gromax users and announced mailing lists, uh, that we've uh, forked off the beta version of Gromax 2020 that will have some of the, the tasty things that I'll uh, hint at during this seminar uh, will be uh, available in those uh, and over the final months of 2020 we'll be hardening that into a high quality release uh, that you'll have in your hands in, in January 2020. Uh, so we've been keeping this annual release cadence for a couple of years now and we plan to keep doing it uh, in the future as well because that makes it uh, an attractive target for both users and developers to understand when the new capabilities will be available so that everybody can plan accordingly. 
Chrome X has been around as a software project for quite a few decades now. We started getting our first citations back in 1995, uh, although the, the software had been around for a little while before that. Uh, and uh, we've had a number of, of quite successful publications over that time. Uh, and as you can see, we uh, have been um, enthusiastically supported by the scientific community, for which we're, we're very thankful. And we do ask that uh, you continue to, do, to remember to uh, cite Gromax uh, in your, your published work uh, in every time that, that you do use it. Um, have a look in your log files to check the paper that we, re we recommend that, that uh, you do cite. Uh, if you're not sure which one to cite, however, you can certainly cite the most recent one that, that you have to hand. Uh, that will go great. Um, but we need to make sure that um, we keep being able to demonstrate to our funding sources and indeed to our industry vendors who might want to make uh, collaborative projects with the Gromax team that will help us be able to run faster and latest hardware. Uh, they need to be able to see that uh, there's uh, many thousands of people who like to use Gromax to do good science with it uh, and uh, everything that you can do to help us make sure that we stay sighted um, would be wonderful as well. If you're publishing in something like Cell or PNAS or Nature or Science, um, please do try to uh, publish uh, cite Gromax from the main text. We realize there are often page limits and so on associated with that. Uh, but if you're doing a, a large scientific project reported in one of these um, flagship journals, uh, we need to be able to see that Gromax is, is having the impact there so that funders keep being able to see that as well. Uh, so please try to try to cite Gromax in the main work, not just in the uh, supplementary uh, in information about methods. Because we've had such a, an active user base doing such high quality science with Gromax, we've been attract, able to attract uh, numerous collaborative sources of, of funding, uh, some of which I will mention in passing as I uh, talk about the kinds of functionality uh, that they have been able to land in the, the Gromax 2019 release, as well as things that has, have happened in the past that give context for those uh, and uh, the directions in which we'll be going in the future. Uh, so we have, as uh, Adam has already mentioned, the main BioXL project. We have some Swedish projects that I'll talk more about, some American projects, uh, several other projects in a few other countries that don't contribute too much to the Gromax core. Uh, and we also have several active vendor co-design projects that are uh, all about making sure Gromax will work well uh, on the upcoming exascale quality supercomputer hardware that's going to be coming uh, in the next few years. So I won't need to say too much more about uh, this particular slide because uh, Adam's covered all that as well in the, the introduction. Uh, but we are here in BioXL working on the core applications, one of which is, is Gromax. And so we are uh, doing several things uh, in and around Gromax over the next couple of years, supported by the BioXL project, uh, one of which will be integrating um, better support for QMM based on the QM package CP2K. Uh, so we uh, expect to be able to do some revamping on the existing QM interface within Gromax and make sure that works pardon me, uh, very well with, with CP2K. So that'll be coming in, in future years. Don't, don't hold your breath for that anytime soon. Um, but that is on the, the long-term roadmap. So in Gromax 2019, we uh, added and, and enhanced several features. Um, we got some feedback from the uh, reproducible build project associated with the, the Debian project, uh, that they had some constructive criticism for us on how to make our build more reproducible. Uh, we used to have a build that kept track of uh, meta information about the computer on which Gromax was built, which might be different from the one upon which it runs. So that was occasionally useful, but not highly useful. Uh, so we took good advice from them and, and removed that. So this enables uh, Gromax, a Gromax build in future to be fully reproducible so that you can uh, know that a particular scientific simulation used a particular version of Gromax that was built in a particular way, uh, which is our little contribution to the overall effort that uh, science needs uh, in order that uh, all of us uh, can reproduce each other's results in the future. Uh, we had a contribution from uh, a startup that I mentioned earlier who were trying to pull uh, drug molecules through skin layers uh, in using Gromax as a, a modeling framework. Uh, they wanted to add a feature to uh, add pulling simulations that would um, be able to understand the, the geometric distribution of the group that they were pulling on, uh, which is important to, to get right if periodic boundary conditions might be uh, going on and pull groups might be large or dispersed or moving a lot over the life of the simulation. Uh, there's a minor feature there that uh, allows that center of mass to bookkeeping to be done from the previous step, which is um, much more stable and much more uh, capable than, than the old style code, which required that pool groups have to stay in the same frame of reference as the, they started early in the simulation. So that's a nice little improvement for any of you doing uh, large pooling simulations. 
uh, one of our analysis tools, GMX Cluster, uh, now produces a PDB file, so a bit easier to use. So this was, uh, again, work supported by BioXL that helps make uh, Gromex uh, easier to use. Um, our normal mode analysis uh, tool, GMX NM IG, uh, now produces thermochemical results, uh, just like quantum packages do, so they can estimate uh, things like um, heat, of, uh, heat capacities and so forth um, based on harmonic, harmonic approximations. So that's a nice little feature if you're doing that sort of work. Uh, and we have a new uh, tool that we forked out of the old GMX dump. Uh, there was a, a dormant feature there that would write a little uh, method section for your, your publication. The GMX report methods will now write to MarTech uh, that will look at the TPR that you used uh, and write some suggested text uh, for you to consider putting in a, in a LaTeX paper. So do check that out and give us some feedback about how well you find it works. Uh, we'll be very interested in to seeing how useful that is. We also had to remove a few features uh, from Gromax because uh, we added them a few years ago when we thought they were a good idea, uh, but sometimes ideas that uh, were good then aren't any good anymore. Uh, so NVIDIA had a while ago uh, a feature called uh, NVML that would allow Tesla-grade GPUs to be able to have their clock speed changed. That feature is still around, but our feedback from users and compute centers was that very few people were able to take advantage of it, so we decided we would remove that. Uh, and simplify the code. Similarly, uh, NVIDIA's GPUs have changed a lot since the early days, um, and the code that we had to support the so-called Fermi class of GPUs, which are about eight, nine years old by now, uh, were getting a bit outdated, making our code more complicated than it needed to be, uh, so that we can continue to uh, implement high-quality things uh, cor as correctly as possible. Uh, we removed that one as well. Uh, those of you who are familiar with uh, multi-simulations, perhaps from doing replica exchange, uh, might be aware that we had uh, two ways to run multi-simulation. There was a minus multi and a minus multi dir. Uh, we removed the minus multi one in favor of the multi dir one because that's a little bit easier for people to use and it's much easier for us as developers to maintain and test if there's only one way of doing one thing. Uh, so that's uh, that's something we announced and deprecated a while ago and we've uh, removed one of the implementations now. So we appreciate that that's going to be a little bit destabilizing for some people, but uh, it's also going to be uh, an improvement in, in some ways. There were several features that simply couldn't be inter implemented well with minus multi. Uh, so multi dir is, is the path to the future. Uh, so please update your scripts for that. Uh, we also decided to consolidate on our strengths and remove the implicit formation feature that we introduced in Gromax 4.5. Unfortunately, no one had had the resources to maintain that for some years. Uh, so we uh, bit the bullet and removed it there. If you are interested in doing implicit sol calculations, we strongly recommend uh, the implementations in the, the AMBER package, among others. Um, and if you want to use those sorts of models, um, then absolutely go and use those. Uh, they're, they're very high quality. We also removed support for the BlueGene family of supercomputers. Uh, they've pretty much all been taken out of service now, uh, so we got uh, our code a bit simplified in, in that direction. Because time has, is moving on and because we need to be able to take advantage of the new features that have been out uh, that many people have available already in their clusters, um, we now require CUDA version 9. That's about 2017 era uh, CUDA generation, if I remember correctly. Might have that wrong by a year or so. Uh, but most of you should have access to clusters that, that are, have at least CUDA 9 installed. So you will need that for the Grimax 2019 releases. Um, and moving forward, we'll probably increase that uh, roughly every year so that we can continue to take advantage of the capabilities that are in the, the newest uh, hardware, because uh, particularly the GPU hardware is, is changing at a frightening pace. Uh, we as developers need to keep up with that while not requiring you to install new stuff absolutely every time you need to upgrade Gromax. Uh, so we had, had to, to strike a balance in the middle there. We do have a Windows support uh, in Gromax, which we're very happy about because it helps make sure that we keep uh, our primary workhorse platform, Linux, um, more portable than they would otherwise be. Um, however, we're only able to support the very latest versions of the Microsoft compiler, so 2017 is required uh, in 2019. Uh, and with that, if you are trying to use GPUs with Gromax, uh, you'll need CUDA 10 for that. Uh, so there's a slightly higher requirement there. And if you're using our support for OpenCL GPUs, which is particularly useful at the moment on AMD GPUs, um, you'll need a, a runtime that supports OpenCL 1.2. Pretty much everybody who's got a, a serious implementation of OpenCL these days does support that, uh, so we decided that it would be uh, good for the world for us to have simpler and more correct code, uh, even if uh, that might occasionally mean you need to update a package. We 
did also announce in GrowX 2019 some things that are going to be changing in future. GMXMD Run has been our simulation workhorse uh, that has done an awful lot of things that involve calculating some forces and changing some coordinates, but not all of them were really MD in the sense of being molecular dynamics. We also had things like uh, membrane embedding preparation tools and energy minimization and reruns that would take the coordinates instead of from being produced by the forces, would read them in from a file. We also had options on the MD run that were useful for benchmarking, but not really interesting for anyone doing a production simulation. So all of that made it difficult to understand, use, document, test, everything around GMX MD run. So we're going to be um, simplifying the user interface quite a bit by moving those things around, uh, and hopefully that will make it easier for us to make sure we have things uh, tested and well-documented as well. Those of you who've been using Gromax in teaching uh, have also probably uh, shamefacedly had to observe at some time that Gromax's integrator MDP option uh, also allows you to choose different kinds of energy minimization functionality. Uh, that's a bit silly because energy minimization is not an integrator in any kind of sense. Um, so we'll be changing that uh, infrastructure there as well. We've been doing a lot of work behind the scenes that hasn't landed in a released version of Gromax yet. That's going to, going to break up a lot of the um, coordinate frame transformation capabilities that are in tools like GMX, Churchcom, Nanocom, uh, and friends like them. Uh, we've been hearing uh, feedback from users for quite a long time that it's uh, a bit frustrating to have to run an MD simulation and then work out how to run TRJCom to get the bits of uh, your simulation that you care about, making sure that they're all in the same simulation cell and the same equivalent periodic boundary representation. Um, we've found out ways to implement those as pre-filters that we'll be able to make available uh, as one pass uh, analysis tools in, in future versions of Gromax. So things that you used to have to use ChurchCon, perhaps multiple passes of ChurchCon for, will be going away. Um, so we're just letting you know that GMX ChurchCon in its current form isn't going to be the pass of the future. Um, but there's uh, no need for you to change anything about how, how you work with that now. Also, uh, there has been a feature in for the last few versions of Gromax where you could tell GMX MD run, no, uh, please ignore the number of steps in the TPR file. I want you to do this many steps. That too was a bit hard to understand and document uh, and was really only useful for people doing benchmarking studies on Gromax. Uh, so we've removed that. And, uh, we hope that uh, only a few of you out there were using that as part of your production workflows, but uh, if you are, Please be advised that will be going away in Gromax 2020, and hopefully we'll be replacing any need for that for benchmarking uh, with a new tool GMX benchmark. So, um, moving on now to some of the, the work that we've landed in Gromax 2019, so that you can hear about some of our new capabilities. Uh, the Swedish eScience Research Center supports one of its uh, core projects, uh, TESI, which is the uh, CERC's e uh, Exascale Simulation Software Initiative, uh, and they support two large Exascale software packages, NEC 5000 and Gromax, uh, running on the, the latest computer hardware uh, in and around uh, the, uh, the, the HPC scene. So for Gromax, they fund uh, the developers that uh, do most of our work on the GPU and CPU accelerated versions of Gromax. Uh, so we're going to look a little bit about the functionality that came in there. Those of you who've been using Gromax for a little while now understand that we have a, a state-of-the-art 3D domain decomposition functionality within Gromax uh, that is able to take uh, any arbitrary kind of simulation cell. So here, for example, one might have chosen a rhombic dodecahedron uh, to model as an approximately spherical but periodically tileable unit um, around a, an approximately spherical protein. Uh, we can take this rhombic dodecahedron, for example, and express that as a triclinic unit cell, which is much easier to, to do the mathematics on about what happens when the particle goes out one side of the periodic boundaries and comes in the other side. Uh, and we've had, uh, for many years in Gromax, uh, the ability to take those triclinic cells and break them up, distribute them over multiple different nodes of the supercomputer, uh, and make sure that the load gets balanced by having the ba uh, domain boundaries uh, stagger backwards and forwards. And so this was reasonably uh, effective for a, a long period of time. We we're very happy with that high-quality implementation, and we, we've got no plans to, to change the, the fundamental nature of how that worked. However, um, we've discovered that uh, some of the um, design choices we made when we implemented it uh, should be rethought. So we have a new feature called update groups. Um, in the past, when we did domain decomposition, we just did like these uh, blue lines you can see. We just did a, a 
vertical chop or a horizontal chop straight through the system. Um, we didn't worry too much about whether we were crossing any particular chemical bonds or any molecule boundaries as we were doing that. Uh, we just said, okay, we're going to do a straight geometric decomposition. Uh, and this worked very well for the force calculation. Uh, it pretty much doesn't matter where bonds are for the, the overall workload of a force calculation. However, it was a pretty bad idea when it came to the update phase. And we've discovered on uh, highly parallel resources that we, were, we could be spending almost as much time in the update and constraints phase as we did calculating the forces, even though there's orders of magnitude less computational work in terms of floating point operations that one has to do during these phases. The reason for that is that if you did chop, uh, say, a carbon-hydrogen bond, which you can see here, uh, and had constraints that needed to be satisfied, um, if you gave one node the responsibility for updating the hydrogen and another node for updating the responsibility for updating the coordinates of the carbon, then they had to coordinate multiple times during the, the update step to make sure that the constraint on that bond length was satisfied. Uh, and that, uh, at particularly high-end high scaling, which is such as we need to focus on uh, as part of our exascale funding, um, wasn't very effective. So instead, what we have available in Gromax 2019 already is the ability for our domain boundaries to, rather than being a, a naive slice straight through, to be a little bit staggered. In fact, what we do is compose the domains out of what we call update groups. So this carbon and this hydrogen, uh, if the constraint option chosen is that all bonds between heavy atoms and hydrogens are to be constrained, they form a constraint group, given the other atoms bonded to that carbon are heavy atoms such as carbons. Uh, and so in this case, we are able to uh, describe this domain out of the union of a set of these update groups, and they've been chosen so that when we're doing the constraint phase, we don't need to do any communication. So those of you running large-scale parallel simulations are likely to see a tidy performance benefit here, simply from the fact that we've avoided a whole bunch of communication that was otherwise painful for you. So you ought to see either higher performance or higher scaling uh, on high-end resources uh, through that uh, communication avoidance strategy. Um, we hope to be able to leverage that uh, in future with other, other developments that are going to be coming in Gromax, but I'll talk more about those a little bit later. Uh, we have a number of active co-design projects with vendors who want to um, produce hardware that's uh, effective for large-scale simulations on supercomputing resources uh, in the long term. Uh, so we have active collaborations with quite a few of these uh, companies, including NVIDIA, ARM, Intel, and AMD. Some of those are larger scale and of longer duration than others. Some have come and gone. Um, but uh, we're, we're working actively on the hardware that we see coming out uh, over the next few years to make sure that on day one, there'll be a released version of Gromax that can do a good job of running on it. Uh, and as we see that hardware uh, have stronger impact in the HPC sphere, we'll be continuing to uh, do our best to make sure that they run optimally on those, taking advantage of the, the features of the hardware. Um, that involves porting Gromax to use GPU acceleration libraries. Uh, many of you will be aware that we've uh, had support for the CUDA acceleration library from NVIDIA for quite some years. And they do an excellent job uh, of uh, producing uh, cutting edge hardware and uh, the library and runtime and drivers that makes those work. We also have support in Gromax for the vendor neutral language OpenCL, uh, which you can use to run Gromax right away, also on NVIDIA devices uh, and on uh, AMD. And in Gromax 2019, one of the new features we uh, added support was for the ability to do that also with Intel's integrated GPUs on laptops. Uh, so all of that technology was actually brought to us by uh, Stream HPC, which is a, a Dutch company that contributed the OpenCL fork, uh, sorry, an OpenCL port of Gromax uh, some years ago. Uh, so they're, they're heavily invested in the OpenCL and uh, vendor neutral computational paradigm, um, and uh, we're very happy to be able to collaborate with them because that has added value to the future collaborations we've been able to have with AMD and Intel particularly. Um, so thanks thanks very much, Vincent and the team at, at Stream HPC. Your, your legacy is living on and being very positive for us. So a little bit of background information on the algorithm that uh, we currently have implemented in Gromax. This is not uh, new work here. We landed this in Gromax in uh, 2016 uh, already. Um, we have the need in any MD package to do something like a pair search. So we maintain lists of particles that are likely to be within the interaction radiuses for the short range interactions. We maintain a pair list and up the, update those periodically during the simulation. Um, and then in the actual MD steps, we have a force calculation that involves computing on bonded interactions, non bonded interactions, sometimes those are called short range interactions, and the longer range or PME interactions. Once you've got all the forces, now we need to integrate the equations of motion 
uh, turn our forces into a velocity update, then into a position update, and then perhaps constrain those updates so that we stay on the um, the uh, Lagrange hypersurface that uh, the user has asked for us with the, the constraint description that was given to Grom BP in the first place. Then we iterate back over this MD step. Every so often, um, the neighbor list has expired, we need to build another one. We found in earlier versions of Grom Access wasn't very effective um, because it added yet another parameter that we would want to tune the, the lifetime there balances the amount of excess flops we do versus uh, some relatively poorly parallelized bit of the code. So a few years ago, um, the SESI project did some great work to um, move us to a dual pair list where we have an inner list that we up update pretty frequently and an outer list that we update very infrequently. Uh, and this has been great because it automatically took uh, a parameter out of the user's hands and delivered um, higher performance all, all for free. Unfortunately, this meant that our code got quite complex. So we'll have a look now at how things work in the guts of Gromax uh, on the next slide. So if there's any impressionable children out there, please please make sure to cover their eyes because uh, things may get a little bit gory right about now. So the key advantage we got uh, from this single pair list was that we were able to um, take more advantage of these waiting periods where we didn't have much, particularly for the GPU to do during the integration constraints um, phase. We do that um, back then on the CPUs only, and we still have that uh, attribute of in the Gromex code still today. Um, what we were able to do, however, was to run this rolling pruning calculation so that we could update our inner list um, in, a, in a rolling and staggered fashion uh, over the duration of the outer list uh, and thereby have an efficient inner list and also make use of this dead compute time. So that was a, a, a nice innovation that um, made things work well. Uh, however, in the overall scheme of things, we're getting pretty complicated these days because we have to maintain neighbor lists of particles that are shared with uh, neighboring domains that we're going to have to communicate over MPI. We've got other short range lists for particles that we're only going to be able to only have to communicate with uh, in a local sense that we won't have to send anywhere else. So we, we do have different priorities for those kinds of work. We have to do our PME work and our bonded work. Um, so the, in, the internal details of Gromex are, are very complex. And so this is why we are vigilant to make sure that when features and things like GPU uh, versions go out of date, that we uh, remove support for those so that we keep this as, as simple and maintainable and correct as, as we possibly can. One of the things we also did for, for Gromex 2016 and, and expanded in Gromex 2018 uh, was to um, move the PME calculation to be able to run also on GPUs. Um, and so in 2016, that was that was available on CUDA GPUs, and in 2018, that was also available on um, OpenCL supporting GPUs. Um, so that's quite fantastic because it means that we're able to take advantage of the extremely uh, cost-effective, particularly uh, consumer-grade GPU hardware that's out there, uh, and can spend less money on um, uh, extremely powerful multi-core CPUs. We still needed those in Gromex 2018 for computing the bonded forces and for the integration and constraints phase, um, but it was less costly than it ever was before. In 2019, however, we added more GPU support um, for that, recognizing that the most cost-effective way to get flops on modern computers is using the GPUs. We added um, further support to free energy perturbation simulations, such as you might use in, in our chemical drug design. Um, any FEP calculations that are doing PME that aren't actually perturbing the charges can now take advantage of the fact that PME can run on GPUs. We had that turned off in early versions of, of this functionality um, just because we hadn't gotten around to testing that it would work, but it did work very well, so we turned that on in Gromex 2019. Unfortunately, you can't use PME on GPUs if the charges are being perturbed because we haven't ported those particular kernels yet, uh, but that may come in a future version. Of course, we added support for the latest generation of uh, NVIDIA's GPUs and made sure that things also worked uh, with the latest uh, GPUs from uh, AMD and Intel as well. We made sure that the PME long range interactions, as I mentioned, uh, run with OpenCL on um, also, sorry, that these long range interactions also run on OpenCL devices, particularly from AMD. So you can get access to those by making sure that your MD run command says, hey, I want the PME calculations to, to run on the GPU. Uh, and thanks to our co-design projects with, with Intel, particularly uh, Roland Schultz, uh, we now have support for running in, uh, running using OpenCL on the Intel integrated GPUs that uh, many of you will find uh, on your current generation laptops. Um, any laptop that's come out the last couple of years probably has an integrated GPU that's able to uh, take advantage of our OpenCL port. Uh, and if you're using your laptop, for example, for little energy minimization or um, 
collaboration workflows, you might find a 25 to 50% speed up. Uh, one thing I didn't realize that I learned in a, in a talk recently that if you look at the amount of silicon that there is on the CPU in, in typical laptops, the GPU that we're now able to take advantage of is actually bigger in terms of number of transistors and uh, uh, CPU die area uh, than the CPU. So it makes quite a bit of sense that uh, this is a useful speed up for Gromax. Uh, so you can um, make your local builds of Gromax on your laptop uh, using the, this combination of flags down here. Unfortunately, um, we didn't have enough time last year to make this cluster size selection automatic, so unfortunately it's a, it's a build time option. But of course, you won't be using that build in any other kind of hardware, um, so we hope that's not too big a deal for you. Um, but you won't be able to take advantage of the Intel GPUs unless you do that. We do have other ongoing projects that are uh, looking to make Gromax work on Intel's upcoming line of discrete GPUs. Uh, that's probably going to be uh, shipped under the Intel XE brand, um, so Intel have changed away from their, their strategy of the, the Knights landing and Knights mill families of processors uh, towards more like a discrete GPU. Uh, so we're going to be working uh, very hard with, with Intel to make sure that uh, any products they're delivering there in the near future will be able to run Gromax. So watch this space. Meanwhile, we had a very effective co-design project uh, with NVIDIA, uh, whose engineers were able to move uh, a large number of the bonded interactions that are in common use in um, by molecular force fields able to be run on CUDA grade GPUs. Uh, so we landed that also in Gromax 2019. So such that uh, this last diagram that you just saw has even less work that is needed to run on a CPU. And so we're continuing to work with NVIDIA's uh, GPU development team uh, to port also our integration and constraints along with the SESI project, supporting some development effort there, uh, so that we're hopeful in Gromax 2020 to be able to have uh, certain kinds of simulations able to run purely on the GPU. Naturally, there will be plenty of kinds of calculation that will yet have been ported. Um, and exactly what we're going to be able to do, we don't know yet, because we've still got quite a few months of development work in front of us. Um, but uh, in particular, the, the work we're doing in collaboration with NVIDIA is um, making sure that we're able to, to take best advantage, particularly of um, the, the capabilities of the very high-end hardware. Uh, but we'll also be making sure that things work on the, the um, consumer-grade hardware that we know many of you have. Uh, finally, we have a, another active project that's funded in America from the National Institutes of Health that's been running for a few years, working on, in two major directions, uh, one of which is a full-scale rewrite of Quiromax's uh, integrator functionality because we've had um, capability to run both uh, LeapFrog and Velocity Verle families of integrators for quite some years. Um, however, there's an awful lot of exciting things we would like to be able to try doing, including having things like um, Monte Carlo Barostats and perhaps multiple time stepping integrators, which would leverage the uh, update groups feature that we've already landed in Gromax 2019. So we hope to see some of these features landing in Gromax 2020. Um, but to do that, um, uh, our co colleagues at the NIH have been working very hard uh, on a complete rewrite of the integrator loops. And so we are going to be landing some of that code shortly. Similarly, other colleagues supported by the NIH um, have been hard at work. And you may have heard already in this particular series. Uh, about the, um, the Python API that we have in development for Gromax. We did land an early version of that in, in Gromax 2019 with some extremely limited functionality uh, that you can hear about in, in last year's GMX API webinar in this series from BioXL. And you can also read about it that, at that paper. Uh, so Gromax 2019 is capable of doing uh, all of the work that they are describing in, in those pieces of work there. Uh, we're landing expanded versions of that uh, as a, a first class thing that we supported in Gromax 2020. So that's, that's looking to be uh, an exciting piece of infrastructure for the future. That's also how we hope to leverage the um, re rewritten functionality that you formerly people used, uh, things like Church Common and Con for uh, the um, automatic pre-filtering technology that uh, BioXL has been developing there will be uh, made available through the, the GMX API technology so that we can get away from these multi-pass command line workflows and instead do everything in single pass Python scripts. Um, so that should be an, an exciting usability improvement um, in the, uh, the Gromax space. In the longer term, we have uh, a very large number of things that are being worked on, um, both in the core team in, in, uh, here in Stockholm, associated with the core team, perhaps with a little bit of funding here and other people supported elsewhere, and indeed some things that are fully remote. Um, I won't go through each of these uh, points here. I've talked about some of them already. But uh, there are lots of things that are going on. We're in particular hoping to have 
container-based distributions of Chromax in future, which will hopefully be easier for distribution in things like Bioconda and uh, using the singularity on supercomputers uh, so that you have as, as easy as possible a time uh, installing and running Gromax. Uh, and we have some funded effort also that's uh, kicking off shortly to make a uh, high quality C++ library around our uh, high performance uh, non-bonded code uh, that uh, will both enable us to start grappling with some of the performance complexity we saw earlier uh, and hopefully make that available so that other people doing uh, software development that needs the kind of functionality that we've already done a good job of making fast and highly portable in Gromax will be able to do that without uh, needing to spend a lot of time rewriting their code for GPUs and um, uh, CPUs and, and what have you. Uh, so there's lots of exciting things coming, uh, um, some of which will land in Gromax 2020 and some of which have longer time frames. Uh, but we hope uh, that uh, we'll be doing the things that uh, you want to see in your simulation packages in future. So as you might expect, there's a tremendous number of people that uh, one could acknowledge over the uh, nearly 30 years of Gromax development. Many of those people have, have moved on to greener pastures, uh, and I haven't listed all of their names here. Um, but we have here numbers of people who've, over the uh, 2019 timeframe, uh, contributed to the functionality that you see in 2019. Uh, so um, they all did a wonderful job, and we're very thankful to, to the effort that uh, they've been able to, to put in, uh, and also to the various funding agencies, including uh, the European Commission and uh, the US NIH and the Swedish Veterans Health Rather for the particular uh, funding sources that um, have supported a lot of these people in their work. Naturally, there's new, several people there also from particular vendors, uh, particularly including uh, NVIDIA and Intel. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution as well. So that brings me to the end of the uh, material that I prepared in the presentation. Uh, as Adam said earlier, I'll be most happy to, to take any of your questions. Uh, I hope you've got uh, lots of thoughts for me. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Mark. That was uh, that was great. Um, so yes, I can see that we've already got some questions coming in. Um, so uh, yes, as a reminder to to anyone who wants to ask a question, you can type it into the the question area in um, in GoToMeeting, uh, which you should find on the the right hand side of your screen, and then I can either uh, invite you to ask your question directly or I can read out your question. So I see the first question from Sergio, Sergio Pantano. Sergio, do you, um, if you have a microphone, feel free to open it now and ask your question. Um, let's see, uh, let me, uh, maybe I have to open it. So let me just try. So we've got quite a lot of people in the room, I have to find you in the list. Uh, okay, so Sergio, do you, would you like to ask your question? Okay, I'm not hearing Sergio. So the, the question is simply, um, are you planning to implement double time step for multi-scale simulations? Does that make sense to you, Mark? Yeah, so there, there are plans to implement a, a multiple time stepping uh, functionality that's going to leverage this this update groups uh, technique that I talked about. Is my screen live, Adam? Uh, no, I can pass it back to you now. Um, just trying to see. Okay, you should be able to. Right. Um, as part of the uh, integrated refactoring that uh, the NIH team has been doing, uh, Pascal Metz and Michael Schwartz have been working on the functionality that we will need for. A, um, a multiple time stepping framework. Uh, so that kind of functionality um, would be an, enable us to run the long range PME kind of contribution much less often, um, perhaps only every uh, four femtoseconds while that we continue to run the short range and bonded work uh, at, a, at a higher frequency, uh, which would uh, offer the kinds of performance that we used to get um, using the uh, virtual sites plus constraints framework that we have in, in Gromax that um, we we now think having tried it out for a few years is, is not as viable a way to get high performance in simulations as these multiple time stepping um, approaches will be. Uh, so yeah, we are actively working on that. Um, we're very, very fortunate that uh, the NIH project has already been doing the necessary work to give us the composable building blocks so that we can have some of our, our force calculations happening both in a rigorous way using a proper um, Trotter style decomposition um, and also uh, eliminating 
these COSPI PME computation bottlenecks. Okay, thank you, uh, Sergio. I hope that answers your question. If it doesn't, then feel free to uh, ask a follow up. Um, so, next, we have a question from Matthias Mercado. Uh, so, I'm going to try to open your microphone, Matthias. Do you, would you like to ask your? Oh, it was just, it was a general. Uh, okay, M Matthias didn't have a microphone. He was just, um, I think the main point of his point was just to, to thank you, Mark, for, for the update and, and to tell you that it was very useful. Actually, I don't see any other specific question there. So, um, uh, yes, hello. There is actually, I'm just noticing there is something in the, in the question uh, that Matthias has asked, which is um, to say he's a fan of Gromax. However, sometimes oh, yes. it is confusing. Do you want to read the rest of it? Yeah, okay. Um, thanks, uh, thanks, Arno. So, um, the, the point further down that I hadn't noticed was, um, uh, so sometimes it's confusing to choose amongst active branch codes, for example, Gromax 2018 versus 2019 series. The same happens with releases. Um, there were seven versions in a year. So uh, he's looking for practical recommendations on how to choose the most stable version for a scientific uh, production. And then there's the follow up is it possible to calculate short range and long range interactions PME on multiple GPUs? So two questions in one there. So on, on the first question, um, when we make a release of, say, of our 2019 branch, the, the functionality is then stable for the year. So um, in terms of which is the, the most recent version, well, that's the one with the most recent year, the most stable version of... Um, so there's, there's no difference in stability between any of the versions that we do release. There were changes between 2018 and 2019 in principle, they could have introduced a bug um, that we haven't caught yet. Um, we can't prove that there isn't a bug, but that's because of a Turing incomplete question, I'm sorry. Um, there's no particular advantage in stability of choosing some old version, particularly if it's out of support. That's a way of guaranteeing you're choosing a piece of software that has bugs in it, um, because we're not actively fixing the bugs in those old branches anymore. So do start your scientific simulations using a, a recently released version of Gromax. Um, both 2019 and 2018 are under active support. If there are bugs we find, we will fix them. Uh, we will make changes in those branches with a, a view towards uh, keeping things working that are already working. The only things we do in these branches are fix bugs. Uh, we don't add new capabilities, so from that point of view, um, things are as stable as they are between all these different versions. The number of versions that get released in the year doesn't say anything about the, the stability of those codes. Um, all that means is that we found issues that were worth fixing and we got those out there. Uh, this is no different from, from any other kind of software out there. They, they release versions that, that fix stuff. For example, Amber uh, simulation packages release um, patches to their, their released versions periodically as they identify issues. They have the same kind of challenges as we do. Um, they have a slightly different way of doing it. Um, but it amounts to the same thing. There are minor changes made to the code. So always use the latest patch release of whichever branch that you're, you're intending to do um, and keep uh, looking at the release notes that we issue with each of those patch releases to see whether there have been any, any issues fixed that affect you. Uh, the second part of your question referred to can we do PME on multiple devices? Uh, there is a branch of Gromax that's under preparation by uh, NVIDIA particularly that would like to take advantage of uh, particularly the capabilities of the Tesla grade hardware, particularly leveraging NVLink, the um, high high speed networks that are available between GPUs. Um, so they are, are hopeful of being able to uh, integrate some code for that into Gromax 2020. Um, there's a long road behind that. Uh, so no, no promises on that uh, at this time. But there certainly are people working on it. It's, it's a huge technical challenge, however. Um, fortunately, projects like BioXL are helping us work on uh, the underlying library infrastructure. Uh, to help uh, refactor things like so that it becomes reasonable and this new non-bonded library project will also be, be helping out with those kinds of things. So yeah, we'd very much like it to happen in, in the future. Um, it's likely only to happen in the context of being able to do data transfers directly between GPUs. Um, so the only technology that's currently on the market that can do that is NVIDIA specific, um, but obviously we'll have uh, ARIA to the ground and make sure that as new technologies come out that are effective for that. Try to support those as well. Okay, thank you, Mark. 
Um, so the next question is from uh, Aniket, Aniket Magarkar. Um, would you like to ask your question directly? Okay, so I um, don't have a microphone. So the question then uh, was, um, uh, it was noted that simulation performance drops down more than 50% when using virtual sites with Gromax 2019. Do you have any thoughts on this, Mark? Um, there's a lot of scope in in virtual sites, uh, so I, I can't comment on any, on any particular kind of um, general phenomenon. Um, yeah. So there's a follow-on statement, I don't know if they're connected, uh, and there's a follow-on question that says free energy simulations, so I don't know whether they're intended to be linked or not. Right, so certainly free energy calculations uh, didn't get any improvements in Gromax 2019, they didn't, didn't get any pessimizations either, if you think you have a, a simulation that ran uh, at all faster in 2018 or earlier versions than they did in 2019, we would be all ears to, to hear about that uh, and to work on fixing it. Um, if you mean that there's performance degradation between running the same simulation without free energy perturbation and with it, yes, that's a, a phenomenon that we're um, well aware of and, and working towards fixing. Um, the reality is that the kernels that we use for doing the kinds of free energy perturbation calculations haven't had anywhere near as much of the high quality software engineering as the, the mainstream simulations have had. Um, that wasn't a problem when people mostly did FEP on you know, a single iron or a methane in water or uh, a 12 or 12 or 20 atom drug molecule. Um, but as people are working towards larger and larger workflows, um, the need for those calculations to run um, faster is, is becoming more and more critical. We do have plans to fix that for Gromax 2020. Um, one thing that is worth mentioning that I actually should have mentioned in the, the main text of the, the presentation that I didn't, uh, is that if you are running on uh, GPU accelerated simulations and you are not perturbing the charges, then you can make sure that you get as many parts of the calculation as possible off the CPUs to leave those free for these uh, perturbed interaction kernels to, to run. So if you make sure that you put um, your non bonded calculations, both parts of your PME and the bonded interactions all on the GPU, you will maximally free up the CPU for running the uh, relatively poorly written kernels that we have uh, for FEP calculations. Um, you'll get better mileage for that process if you are running on uh, Tesla grade GPUs from, from NVIDIA than you will from running on uh, consumer grade GPUs either um, from NVIDIA or AMD. Um, but uh, those are some tips and tricks that are, are worth thinking about in those cases. I don't think virtual sites themselves are actually relevant to the question. Okay, uh, thank you, Mark. Um, so, Aniket, if you do have any other follow-up, just uh, type it in, but hopefully that ask, answers your question. Um, so, the uh, next question, which uh, I'm just about to find here. Um, yes, it's from, from Zach Hughes. Zach asks, are there any plans to incorporate or improve modeling of Druda force fields into main grow match, into the main grow match release? Uh, there certainly has been, yeah, carry there on. certainly has been some, some work done, particularly by uh, Justin Lemkul and his collaborators uh, a few years ago. So there is a, a fork of Gromax 5.1, I think it was, um, that uh, got done a couple of years ago that does have uh, a reasonably useful uh, version of Gromax that does have support for that. Um, there haven't been any moves to incorporate that into mainstream versions of Gromax. Um, that would be a, a considerable piece of work because we would need to um, modify a lot of the performance core for force calculations. Um, still, it's a, it's a very exciting piece of work and it's a way to uh, improve modeling accuracy um, and take uh, advantage of the uh, ever-increasing flop density of, of pieces of hardware. Um, so there's, there's nothing in the pipeline that um, would facilitate that, but uh, it's something that we'd be interested to, to talk with people who um, have enough spare software developer cycles to, to prioritize work on that. It's a little bit of a chicken and the egg um, problem there. You need a high quality implementation in order for people to show that there are important problems that, that need these kinds of treatments. I understand that particularly uh, simulations of DNA and RNA are particularly improved by uh, these kinds of polarizable force fields. So 
So we'll, we'll be keeping our eye on that, um, and uh, when the opportunity is right, um, we'll certainly uh, be interested to, to make those things work better. But for now, I, I do encourage people to check out Justin's uh, port and give him some feedback uh, on, on how those, you find those work. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is from Amin Sagar. Uh, Amin, I'm opening your microphone if you do have any, uh, if you are able to ask directly. No? Okay, so um, in that case, the question, uh, to summarize it says, are there any benchmarks for different GPUs and CPUs like the ones available for Amber um, to, to help to decide what kind of hardware to buy? Very much there are. Um... They have even been uh, computed as part of so there is a preprint out at the moment um, that updates uh, how one should go about uh, choosing hardware uh, to run for Gromax. So the title of the paper is More Bang for Your Buck Improved Use of GPU Nodes uh, for Gromax 2018. Um, and the conclusions from that are pretty much always applicable to Gromax 2019 with the caveat that in some cases, if you're using Tesla grade hardware, you'll be able to, to um, get benefit from the ability of or Gromax 2019 to also offload some bonded interactions uh, in, in the same same way. So that's currently uh, un, under review, um, but uh, that was worked on by some of the, the core developers in, in um, uh, SESI and uh, BioXL. So that's, that's a very high quality piece of work that um, provides guidance on what sort of performance you should be able to see and which sorts of hardware you might want to consider buying or renting uh, to run Gromax on. Uh, so yeah, very, very strong thumbs up for the work they've, they've done there. That's great. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, so uh, I think we've got time for just one or two last questions. Uh, Zach had a, an additional one as well. He asks, Considering the wide use of PluMed with GMX, is testing taking place to ensure they're compatible? And which version of PluMed should we use with GMX 2019? Um, I know I have seen um, comments on Plume's, uh, PluMed's GitHub uh, that they are planning to support a version of, of GromX 2019. Um, that's, that's up to them when they make their next release. I'm not quite sure what their, their release timelines are. Um, but uh, we, we don't collaborate closely with or, or deliberately test uh, Gromax with Plumed. Um, one of the challenges there is that, of course, they intend Plumed to be a project that um, works with multiple MD packages. Um, so while we're very glad that uh, they're able to, to make downstream use of Gromax, um, they want to keep uh, a little bit uh, agnostic with respect to simulation engines, so they, they haven't um, streamed any of the, the, the code that might be um, useful to incorporate within Gromax at some point. Uh, I understand that may have happened for LAMP, so we could consider um, doing that in future also for Gromax. So if you're a, a Plumed developer and you want to help make that happen, then please do get in touch with us. The door's always open. Um, but no, we don't, don't specifically test. Um, so yeah, I would use check out the latest version of Plumed, and hopefully they support Gromax 2019. I know that they support some of the Gromax 2018 versions. Um, but. Uh, as always, use the, the versions of Gromax that the Plumed developers say they have tested um, because they're the ones who, who understand uh, how to test their software well. Um, nothing much has changed in Gromax that affects how they do use Gromax. So I expect probably that any released version of, of Plumed will work with 2019 point releases, but follow their documentation, please. Okay, thank you for that advice, Mark. Um, and I think we are now, we're coming up to the, the top of the hour and there are no further questions in the queue. So um, I think then I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank you very much again for a very interesting talk and um, uh, to remind everyone that they can keep in touch with us through uh, BioXL, go to the BioXL website and uh, click to, to sign up for the newsletter. It's the best way to keep in touch with what we're doing. And there's also a page, bioexcel.eu slash webinars, where you can always keep up to date with the, the webinars that are, are upcoming from BioExcel. So uh, thank you all for coming along today. And thank you, Mark, for your, your talk today. And we hope to, to see you all again at a BioExcel webinar or event very soon. Thank you.